Hello everyone, uh, my name is Neda Faris. I am a Kuwaiti writer, teaching artist, and performance poet. And I wrote this lecture today for Gulf University for Science and Technology's Mind Boost series. Um, and it was originally given on Clubhouse, but some of the participants there had requested that it be uploaded. So I am uh, your ever obliging poet. This is what I'm doing with this lecture. And just a little bit of background on why I wrote this topic. Um, the title is called Poetry, Madness or Magic, A Brief History. And it really is a brief, brief history. We, we don't reach beyond the Renaissance technically, um, only because so much of the association of poetry and madness or poetry and melancholy and uh, inspiration versus craft, um, so much of what we think is conventional nowadays comes to us from the modern era, from the Renaissance onward, you know, through the, the Romantics and so on. But I thought it might be really uh, helpful to anchor, ground, and historicize poetry's association with um, magic or possession, spiritual possession on one side, with um, poetry's association with mental disorder on the other, particularly because I live in a place where certain um, representatives are saying interesting things that's, that seem that they are disconnected. On the one side, there is a proposal um, to assign the death penalty for witchcraft. And then on the other side, um, a different representative is proposing certain draconian measures to deal with expats with mental illness. And like I said, uh, you know, at a first glance, you might think that those two things are completely disconnected. And one of the reasons I wanted to do this project, historicize poetry's relationship to possession or magic witchcraft on one side and mental illness on the other, is really to show us that history has given us a precedence for these kinds of statements and this kind of mentality. Um, and I, I just wanted to bring that history to light. So this is my reasoning. Who am I? I am a poet from the Middle East. Um, I suffer from bipolar myself, a bipolar type two. And I have a personal stake basically in uh, this project. Uh, and please don't mind the um, mic. If it pops up, it pops up. I mean, that's life. All right, so without further ado, um, Poetry, Madness, or Magic, A Brief History. The conflict between theologians and doctors is a long and persistent one. Already in ancient Greece, we find Hippocrates arguing with Plato over definitions and causes of mental disorder. Andrew Solomon writes in The Noonday Demon and Atlas of Depression, Greek medical practice was based on humoral theory, phlegm, yellow bile, blood, and black bile. In The Nature of Melancholy, from Aristotle to Kristeva, Jennifer Redden explains that the term melancholy comes from two Greek words, melis, black, and coli, bile. So melis, coli, melancholy. The medical profession in ancient Greece be believed that when black bile was in malign ascendancy, it caused sadness, anxiety, moral dejection, tendency to suicide and aversion to food, despondency, sleeplessness, irritability, and restlessness, accompanied by prolonged fear. Hippocrates and the doctors who followed him located the seat of emotion, thought, and mental illness in the brain, writing, it is the brain which makes us mad or delirious, inspires us with dread and fear, whether by night or by day, brings sleeplessness, inopportune mistakes, aimless anxieties, absent-mindedness, and acts that are contrary to habit. These things that we suffer all come from the brain when it is not healthy. In contrast to Greek doctors, Greek theologians and philosophers saw mental illness as disturbances rooted in the soul of a person because the mind and the body were mere copies of one's soul. From Plato, we get one of the first associations of madness 
poetry, and supernatural possession. This association, however, is contradictory at first glance and thus requires some analysis. From his Ion and Phaedrus, we receive from Plato a direct link between poetry and madness. Moreover, creative madness in Ion and Phaedrus exude positive traits. In his Republic, on the other hand, his most cited book on poetry, both madness and poetry are critiqued and deemed dangerous, requiring severe censorship, even banning and exile, to maintain the authority of the leaders of the city-state. It might help us to look at some of these statements as many of our modern associations are variations on these early utterances. Plato writes in Ion, You know none of the epic poets, if they're good, are masters of their subject. They are inspired, possessed, and that is how they utter all those beautiful poems. The same goes for lyric poets, if they're good, lyric poets, too, are not in their right minds when they make those beautiful lyrics. But as soon as they sail into harmony and rhythm, they are possessed by Bacchic frenzy. Creative madness is thus established by Plato as a divine possession. Bacchus was the Roman god of wine, fertility, and agriculture, and was the equivalent to Dionysus in the Grecian pantheon. From poetry's Dionysian or Bacchic connection, blossoms the idea that the arts are spiritually deviant hubs uh, attracting wine and lewd behavior. Plato continues on in the Ion writing, for a poet is an airy thing, winged and holy, and he is not able to make poetry until he becomes inspired and goes out of his mind and his intellect is no longer in him. As long as a human being has his intellect in his possession, he will always lack the power to make poems or say many lovely things about their subjects. But because it is a divine gift, each poet is able to compose beautifully only that for which the muse has aroused him. Plato in the second quote elevates the poet as a, ve as a vessel for the mu muses protectors of the art and sciences, and daughters of the Greek god Zeus and the titan uh, of memory, uh, Nemosini. In other words, while he does not break down the distinction between two types of madness and ion, he at least demonstrates an awareness that creative and divine inspiration is plural rather than singular. He attributes the first kind of frenzy and Dionysian possession. This is the madness of alcohol and hedonistic pleasure. The other divine inspiration, as shown in the second quote in Ion, renders the poet an airy thing, winged and holy. This is poetry of elevation and illumination, where the muses, rather than Dionysus, possess the soul of the poet. Overall, however, Plato, Plato's ideas in Ion about poetry and about divine possession are positive, going so far as to explain that poets cannot learn how to write poetry, that they are nothing but servants to divine inspiration, and that God uses them in the same way he uses prophets and diviners. Plato writes so that we should be in no doubt about it, that these beautiful poems are not human, not even from human beings, but are divine and from gods, that poets are nothing but representatives of the gods possessed by whoever possesses them. To show that, the god deliberately sang the most beautiful lyric poem through the most worthless poet. Plato's a savage. <coughs> so put differently, poets do not need to be good at language, according to Plato, or rhetoric or poetics. Even the most unintelligent person can become, according to Plato, a supreme poet if and when struck by divine inspiration. In Phaedrus, Plato elaborates on madness and divine possession. He notes at least four types, each associated with a different entity in the Greek pantheon. Those who are possessed by Apollo, writes Plato, will receive the gift of prophecy. Incidentally, when the Qur'an is first revealed in the Arabian Peninsula, Arab tribes accused Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, of being a mere poet, possessed by the jinns associated with poetry. 
The Prophet, of course, counters in numerous Quranic phrases and verses. In Yasin, for example, we read, We have not taught the Prophet poetry, nor could he have ever been a poet. This is a revelation, an illuminating Quran to warn anyone who is truly alive, so that God's verdict may be passed against the disbelievers. And again, in Al-Haqqa, Al we read, This Qur'an is the, is the word spoken by an honored messenger, not the word of a poet, how little you believe, not the word of a soothsayer, how little you, ref you reflect. This Qur'an is a message sent down from the Lord of the worlds. In the surah named after the poets, Ash-Shu'ara, we read this demarcation again. That while the Qur'an is an outcome of divine inspiration, it should not be mistaken for poetry. Truly, this Qur'an has been sent down by the Lord of the worlds. The trustworthy spirit brought it down to your heart so that you could bring warning in a clear Arabic tongue. It is worth adding a final quest, uh, quotation from the Qur'an. To emphasize its divine possession as something other than demonic or inspired by jinn. <clears throat> we read again in the poet's verse. It was not the jinn who brought this Quran. It is neither in their interest nor in their power. Indeed, they are prevented from overhearing it. So prophet, do not invoke any gods beside God or you will incur torment. What we see in Phaedrus's first type of divine inspiration is the gift of prophecy. Whereas this gift in pagan Greece uh, was attributed to the god Apollo, the Quran names its muse as the trustworthy spirit, the angel, the archangel Gabriel, or Jibril. After elucidating the first type of madness or of divine inspiration, Plato in Phaedrus moves on to name three other types. One of them, the divine possession that occurs as a result of performing sacred, spiritual, or magical rites. This will be associated with witchcraft in later times. The deity in charge of this possession is none other than Dionysus, god of wine and fertility. Plato writes where madness has entered holy, with holy prayers and rites, and by inspired utterances found a way of deliverance for those who are in need. And he who has part in this gift and is truly possessed and duly out of his mind is by the use of purifications and mysteries made whole, and he will experience a release from the calamity which was afflicting him. In other words, via sacred rites, practices and utterances, people may inspire a Dionysian possession which gives the possessed power over the natural world. Another type of madness stirs from love-related topics, permitted and controlled by Aphrodite. The history of melancholia and madness is full of love-related traumas. Hippocrates had already identified lack of love as a source for mental disorder, and mental disturbance. He cured, for example, the melancholy of King Perdiccas II by persuading him to marry the woman he loved. Arabic poetry, both pre-Islamic and post-revelation, effervesce with creative madness associated with love, an extreme example of how insanity may ensue as a consequence of unrequited love, is encapsulated by the story of Ashanfar al-Azidi, one of the most notorious of the Sa'alik poets, who were often misanthropic and fiercely independent. The Sa'alik were men that broke away from their tribes to tread as vagabonds, writing poetry that glorifies violence and wreaking havoc on those who cross their paths. al shanfar al-Azidi turned against his foster tribe and killed a hundred of them after he was turned down by a girl. In Platonian terms, we may say that Ashanfar al-Azidi was possessed by Aphrodite, whereas King Perdiccas II's madness was healed when Hippocrates convinced him to marry the woman he loved. But Plato identifies another type of madness. This, he says, is purely poetry-centric. This while Apollo, Dionysus, and Aphrodite might inspire poetry each in their own style, i.e. Apollo 
the prophetic, Dionysus the magical, and Aphrodite the romantic. Those three types of madness do not view pro poetry as a priority. They view it rather as a secondary outcome. Possession by the muses, on the other hand, is, according to Plato, what renders madness fully poetic. This kind of madness, says Plato, where a delicate and virgin soul is possessed by the muses, experiences frenzy and inspiration, and the awakening of lyrical and other types of talents. Plato emphasizes again that, this, that it is not craft and experience that makes poetry powerful. He who having no touch of the muse's madness in his soul, declares Plato, comes to the door and thinks that he will get into the temple by the help of art, and he means craft, he, I say, and his poetry are not admitted. The same man disappears and is nowhere when he enters into rivalry with the madman. So as mentioned earlier, Plato's views on poetry in Ion and Phaedrus seem to contradict his writing in the Republic, his most cited book on his views on poetry, in which he deems poetry dangerous and exiles the poets out of his Republic, except for those who write, quote, hymns to the gods and eulogies of virtuous men. His views on the threat of poetry to disrupt uh, the city-state, however, complements his words on poetry's association with madness and divide possession in the previous books. I mean, says Socrates to Glaucon, haven't you ever fallen under the spell of poetry? Poetry is powerful, especially the kind that moves people to thoughts and actions, that defy logic, convention, tradition, and accepted norms. The kind of madness that Plato describes in Ion and Phaedrus is disruptive. It's madness that rends the fabric of the natural world. Yes, poets who are capable of channeling this divinity are great artists, he says. But that very power means they may compete with the city-state's authority and control the minds of the public for their own ends. You should concede that Homer is a supreme poet and the original tragedian, writes Plato. But the point is that a young person can't tell when something is allegorical and when it isn't. And any idea admitted by a person of that age tends to become almost ineradicable and permanent. All things considered then, that is why a very great deal of importance should be placed upon ensuring that the first stories they hear are best adapted for their moral improvement. And this is what we get from Plato's Republic. Not only his projected fear around poetry's ability to disrupt conventions and challenge political authorities, but also his proposals for ways in which to tame and to ensure that poets do not open themselves up to possession and that they write instead with the, communi with the community in mind. <clears throat> so how do you control people? How do you ensure that everyone does what they are told, not what they are moved to do? That is the real project of Plato's Republic. And he starts his project by separating reality from an imaginary ideal where things are perfect. And he contrasts reality with this ideal. Because according to Plato, poets are depicting copies of copies. And thus they are twice removed from truth. For example, a poem of a chair is twice removed from the truth of the chair. Whereas the chair itself, the physical chair, is only once removed from the truth or the idea of the chair that exists in this perfect realm. So now Plato has a hierarchy of existence. This means the differences no longer operate on a horizontal realm, but rather they take on vertical connotations. 
Hippocrates and the Greek doctors had also believed that a long labor of the soul can produce melancholy. In other words, that engaging in poetry and serious contemplative pursuits may lead to depression or madness. However, Greek doctors did not negatively interpret the associations between long labors of the soul and mental disorders. Because Greek doctors started with the body, they knew that differences in experience was the norm. And when they treated physical and mental illness, they did not judge their patients because bodies and minds suffer in various ways and the medical profession is there to heal these pains, not to interpret them on a moral scale. On the other hand, because Greek philosophers and theologians hierarchized existence, where the best was ideal, perfect, true, good, and godly, and the farther one gets from this ideal realm, the more impure, false, bad, and ungodly they become. After describing what he means by poetry being twice removed from truth, Plato in his Republic then provides the following insights, writing, quote, There is nothing of the lying poet in God. And following it with, quote, Anyone witless or insane is no friend of God. This is a dramatic departure from the poet and the madman being airy things, winged and holy. The association of the poet driven to beautiful lyrics and other types of art by Apollo, Dionysus, Aphrodite, or the muses works only when you want to live in a world where change and transcendence are permissible. But who can control the divinely inspired poet? Especially if poetry itself is a great vehicle for impacting its listeners. Knowing this, Plato writes in the Republic <clears throat> that poets set their words to quote, meter, rhythm, and music. It only takes these features, says Plato, to cast this powerful a spell. That's what they're for. Hence, Plato advocates for censorship of poetry, especially the kind that might awaken the public and inspires them to question what is good and what is bad for themselves. To this end, Plato recommends that poetry in the Republic must never represent men mourning and grieving the loss of loved ones or fortune. But he, this is okay for women, but it's not okay to depict men mourning and grieving. For goodness should only be associated with control over one's emotions, and thus goodness should only be associated with men, not with women, right? He writes in the Republic, we can also agree that a good man is preeminently capable of providing himself with a good life entirely from his own resources, and is absolutely the last person to need anything, uh, anyone or anything else. Weakness in mind and body <clears throat> are thus denounced by the Greek philosophers as negative features. Greek doctors, on the other hand, focusing on the body and the mind and not comparing that to an imaginary ideal, saw differences as part of the human experience and responded to weakness with the desire to heal and alleviate pain rather than to judge their patients. And I'm, and I'm speaking broadly here, right? Hippocrates even twisted Plato's own diminutive views of the arts as twice removed from truth and calls the practitioners of sacred medicine, those who invoked the gods to effect cures, he calls them swindlers and charlatans. And he said that all that philosophers have written on natural science no more pertains to medicine than to painting. In other words, according to Hippocrates, it is the philosophers themselves and the theologians who are spreading lies and fantasies about the human body twice removed from truth, right? The divide between the medical profession and the religious ideological authorities continued until the late Roman era when Christianity began to rise. This is when we find an added element to the discussion on melancholy, namely, namely the element of choice. 
Saint Augustine, for example, had declared that what separated men from beasts was the gift of reason. And so the loss of reason reduced man to a beast. From this position, it was easy to conclude that the loss of reason was a mark of God's disfavor. His, position, his uh, punishment for a sinning soul. In this, the Christian authorities were depending on Greek philosophy, not Greek medicine. And specifically, Christianity was influenced by the Stoic philosophers who argued that living a, virtual, uh, a virtuous life leads to happiness and that doing good deeds lifts the spirit. Thus, in the West, during the Dark Ages, melancholy stopped being viewed as a disturbance in the mind and was more and more described in terms of conscious actions and decisions. And thus, melancholy was to be punished rather than treated. Jennifer Redden writes, John Cassian was raised in, Christi in a Christian monastery in Bethlehem during the second half of the 4th century. And although not much is known about his early life, he is one of the most influential figures in the history of the early Christian church. For Cassian, melancholy is not only a bad habit, rather than a mental disease. It was in fact one of the seven deadly sins, which came to be known as sloth. In Latin, it was known as acidi, and Cassian writes, our sixth combat is against the spirit of a CD and what its character is, which we may term weariness or distress of heart. This is akin to dejection. And Radin explains that Cassian understood a CD to result from uh, temptation by demons. <clears throat> so Solomon rightly concludes, it is from this tradition that the stigma still attached to depression today has grown. The soul being a divine gift should be perfect. We should strive to sustain its perfection and its imperfections are the primary source of shame in modern society. Equipped with these biases, the situation in the West for melancholics and for the arts, as is well documented in the Dark and, and Middle Ages, grows dire and dire. Melancholics are fined, tortured, and executed at varying times. The more that depression is associated with lack of will and of demonic possession, the more that Christian theologians excel in cruel and draconian solutions. By the time of the Inquisition in the 13th century, writes Solomon, some depressives were fined or imprisoned for their sin. In this period, Thomas Aquinas, whose theory of body and soul placed the soul hierarchically above the body, and we had seen this already with Plato, that the soul has precedence over the body. But with Aquinas, now he could conclude that the soul was, sub uh, that the soul was not subject to bodily illness. Since the soul was, however, below the divine, it was subject to intervention by God or Satan. Within this context, <clears throat> an illness had to be of the body or of the soul, and melancholia was assigned to the soul. And with Dionysus and Aphrodite and Apollo all out of the picture, with only an ultimate good seen as God and an ultimate bad seen as the devil, it is no wonder that the Christian theologians in the Dark and Middle Ages, ages wrestled with witches and witchcrafts. It was only until the 16th century when Johann Weir presented a somewhat humane position of witchcraft. And notice we're saying from uh, around like the 4th century to the 16th century, these are hundreds and hundreds of years of superstition and cruelty as uh, quote unquote solutions to deal with mental illness and with um, poetry or the arts and uh, magic or witchcraft or possession. So anyway, it was only until the 16th century when Johann Weir presented a somewhat humane position on witchcraft. In De Prestigis uh, De Monum of Deceiving Demons, sometimes thought of as the first textbook of psychiatry, Weir describes the, se uh, the seeming presence of the supernatural power associated with witchcraft as a disturbance of the imagination. He writes, let it be known 
uh, with certainty that no harm has come to anyone from them, meaning witches, in reality, but only in their imagination. And for the men who complain about the witch's power, Weir suggests that they should be informed with sounder doctrine so that they may repudiate the demon's illusions and pledge allegiance once more to Christ. In other words, Weir explains that witches are themselves delusional if they think that they have supernatural power, which, according to him, is the domain of God Almighty, not of human beings. He goes a step further, though, and writes that the men who are yelping about witches, 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 are also themselves deranged and delusional. And for the same reasons that witches are crazy, in other words, men who cry witches and women who pretend that they have supernatural powers are all deluded by demons, um, according to Weir, of course. And they are deluded into thinking that they can alter the natural order because their faith in true doctrine is weak. The devil loves to insinuate himself into the melancholic humor, writes Weir as being a material well suited for this mocking deception. Saint Jerome has therefore most appropriately termed melancholia the devil's bath. So all of this was happening in Christian Europe during the dark in the Middle Ages. Again, we're, we're talking about centuries and centuries of superstition and mistreatments of um, those who are suffering from mental illness and those who are perceived to be as witches and of course anyone related to the arts all in the name of religion right but in the house of wisdom how the arabs transformed western civilization jonathan lyons writes western notions of medicine were based largely on superstition and exorcism in sharp contrast to the arabs advanced clinical training and understanding of surgery pharmacology and epidemiology the reason that new scientific and philosophical traditions spread across the entire arab muslim lands at the same time that the western world was experiencing a dark age was because in contrast to their christian counterparts muslim doctors followed the greek medical tradition when writing about the body and illness not the philosophical tradition right lion writes Unlike the medieval Christian West, which tended to view illness and disease as divine punishment, the Arab physicians looked for imbalances or other physical causes that could be treated as part of their religious mission. Following the Greek medical tradition as well as the Quranic injunction on the need to heal the sick, spurred enormous gains in medicine and the creation of advanced hospitals, complete with such innovations as specialized wards, regular doctors rounds, free health care for indignant patients, and humane treatment of the insane. By the way, the Quran is full of verses that call for treating those who are suffering from mental illness humanely with kindness and compassion. So in fact, the early 13th century when Western scholars began to introduce Arab and Muslim science into the West, Christian theologians severely condemned the new knowledge, particularly for its undertones of pagan Greek philosophy. The Arab Muslim world's medical authorities, such as Avicenna ibn Sina, and his immediate influences, Shaq ibn Imran and Hali Abbas, knew Greek medical lore. And although there were also more direct sources through the Latin translations of the Greek words, it was, it was they and their Arab Muslim counterparts who were to a large extent responsible for returning the medical tradition regarding melancholy as a mental illness, not a cardinal sin, back to Western Europe. Before we end this paper and you know talk about the Renaissance onward, we have to synthesize some notes on what happened in the Arab Muslim world. In the time before Islam, the poet was viewed as a person possessed by jinn or spirit. In fact, the root for the word poet in Arabic, sha'ir, are the three letters sheen, ain, ra. They are used to create the word sha'ir, meaning he knew, sensed, or felt. And shu'ur, that is feeling or intuition, 
A poet in pre-Islamic Arabia was thus felt possessed by a jinn, one of the sprites that were thought to haunt the landscape. In a biography on the Prophet Muhammad, Karen Armstrong writes, Indeed, poetry was not only considered super superhuman, but was also believed to have magical qualities. The curse of an inspired poet could have disastrous effect on an enemy. And this is this is amazing. This is my like favorite part. Robert Irwin writes in Night and Horses and Desert, uh, an anthology of classical Arabic literature. The pre-Islamic poetry dealt with desperate battles, despairing love, oaths of honor, grand gestures of hospitality, bitter blood feuds, and such like subject matter. Poetry was often recited by the tribes as warriors rode to battles, and sometimes, writes Irwin, battle did not take place as the hostile tribes agreed instead to have their dispute settled by a poetry contest. We're, we're talking about war that is set aside for a poetry contest, and the winners of the poetry contest win the actual war. So what we have in Arabia, and which will continue until Sufi poetry begins to alter the definition again, is the mad inspired poet as the manic, not as the melancholic. Even when poetry sl uh, slowly loses its occultist association and rhymed cadence, cadence prose is used to create effects that were purely literary and rhetorical in the Islamic period, and poets use their verse to generate wealth and fans and patronage, there never really develops a melancholic link to poetic madness in the Arab Islamic world. Even Sufi poetry, which finds a rich soil in Turkish, Persian, and other Asian lands, never broadly adopts melancholy. The mania attached to the mad poet is that of joy beyond logic. On Frederick Starr's Lost Enlightenment, Central Asia's Golden Age from the Arab Conquest to Tamerlane, he writes, Poets at the time could neither imagine nor be attracted by the ideal of the impoverished but soulful artist ensconced in his garret. Even, like I said, like even Sufi poetry with their mad wanderings and their ascetic ideals, it still is not melancholic. It is manic and full of joy and love for the divine. So this ideal first emerges in 15th century Europe, specifically in Italy, when Marciella, when Marci, blah, 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 sorry, when Marsilio Ficino, there we go, resurrects an idea that is attributed to Aristotle. In a book called Problemata Physica, whose authorship is questionable, but which is attributed to the Greek student of Plato, Aristotle, the ideal of the mad poet as a melancholic becomes famous in the West, via Ficino and the Western intelligentsia who subscribe to it. The line in the Problemata asks, Why is it that all who have become outstanding in philosophy, statesmanship, poetry, or the arts are melancholic or are affected by the diseases arising from black bile? The Renaissance represents the moment in history when Western powers begin a gradual ascendancy, and as they colonize lands, they also displace cultures and cultural associations. Today, it is commonplace to think of a poet not as Antara bin Shaddad, a warrior, or as Jalal al-Din al-Rumi, a Sufi mystic, even though al-Rumi's poetry is, is the most uh, sold in the United States. Today, when we think about the poet, we don't think of a poet flushed with divine energy by way of transcendent joy. But rather, we view the poet as a deep, sensitive soul, abnormal in habit, and morose in humor. By the end of the 16th century and throughout the 17th, writes uh, Andrew Solomon, ordinary melancholy had become a common affliction that could be as pleasurable as, as it was unpleasant. All right, so this is not the whole story of madness or of poetry or of magic, of course, right? But I hope at least to have anchored some of our assumptions in historical contexts to help us better decode our views, to see where we stand on the topic, and to have at least some basic 
lexical tools to help facilitate a rewrite of our own assumptions if and when we desire. Thank you.